So our next speaker is Dr. Rodney St. John. Dr. S uh, Dr. John is an assistant professor at, of turf grass, of turf grass science at Kansas State University, and he's the turf grass extension specialist for Kansas. He has several of those YouTube videos you can watch as well about different aspects of turf, right? Yep. He is another one of those uh, people whom I constantly invite to guest lecture to my students. He's very energetic. You can see, you know, he's very. My students, you know, really like what he has to say. He always tells the students how he started uh, doing turf. He, he, he started mowing grass when he was 12, 13, 14. He had his own business, he tells my students. So my students are very interested in what he has to say all, always as well. Uh, at K-State, Rodney provides research, education, and assistance to increase the profitability, sustainability, and growth of the commercial turf grass industry of Kansas. And Dr. St. John joined the K-State team in 2006 after finishing his PhD from Iowa State University. And uh, Dr. St. John's office is located in the, at the Horticultural Research and Extension Center in Oleta, Kansas. That's off, Sa off Santa, Santa, Fe. Fe. Santa Fe, right? Okay. Uh, and uh, Rodney gives guest lectures to, like I mentioned before, he gives, uh, you know, um, to my Intro to Hot students. He always comes in and, and talks about turf. So thank you, Rodney. Right. Thank you. And he's going to talk today about urban myths and legends involving lawn management. And he will t talk about the correct ways to manage your lawn. Okay. Which one do I wear? This one? Yeah, this one. Alright. And this is the easy one. Alright. Get all hooked up here. Alright, good afternoon. That's going to be a hard presentation to uh, follow up. Maybe I should uh, jump off the stage a few times here and uh, crowd dive or something. But anyway, so the topic I'm going to talk about is called Myth Busting the Law Edition. When I give talks to homeowners and when I talk to homeowners, they're always asking me the same type of question, you know, well, I heard about this, or so-and-so does this, or Jerry Baker, you know, mix up some urine and spread it out on your grass and, and, and grow things. So we're going to talk about some of those myths and bust them and uh, try to give you good information about lawn care. I'm trying to, I've got too many slides in this presentation, I already know, but I like to talk fast, uh, so I apologize for that up front. Uh, if I say something too fast or if you got questions about anything I show up here, you know, stop me and, and we don't have to wait till the end of the presentation, you know, shout them out right away as they come up in your mind during this presentation. So a couple websites I'm going to show you throughout the presentation. One of them is called Healthy Yards and Communities. Uh, this is a program that is designed to help homeowners have nice, healthy landscapes without harming the, harming the environment. And the URL, URL is there at kansasgreenyards.org. The one thing I like to point out, like Lika talked about, is we have a section on there called Healthy Yards Videos. There's about 150 different videos on that website, three to five minutes in length, that go through all kinds of topics. Uh, one of the most viewed web, one of the most viewed videos is the one that has to do with how to oversee your yard uh, that I'm in. But there's also, you know, how to divide daylilies, how to build a hot box or a cold frame, how to stake your tree, how to plant your tree, all kinds of good information on that website for all kinds of needs in your landscape. So I'd tell you to check out that website and get more information. And if you're in the Johnson County area, there is a, an assessment that you can take. How healthy is your yard? You can take that assessment. It's a, a self quiz, if you will. You say, this is what I'm doing in my yard. And it'll give you some information on what you're doing right and what you're doing wrong. And if you get a good enough grade, you can submit that to the Johnson County Extension Office and I think they're still uh, allowing you to buy a sign or they'll give you a sign that you can put in your yard that says, hey, I am a Johnson County certified healthy yard and community yard. And uh, I've got one in my front yard. It's just kind of a nice little thing to have in my yard. And people go, what's that? And I tell them about it and, and spread the good word that way. So something to take a look at. Um, so here's a uh, so, um, first myth for the day. So nice lawns and golf. And, and Stu started off this morning. Which way do I go? So I'm already walking back and forth. I'm getting dizzy up here. But so I'll, I'll, most of the people over here, so I'm going to kind of focus on this slide uh, side of the room. But uh, so some people think that maintaining a nice lawn or golf courses, if you have a nice golf course in the neighborhood, that that's actually poisoning the environment. They think, oh, well, if you're fertilizing the grass, you're doing bad things. You're causing three-eyed toads and things like that. And the truth of the matter is, is that a good, healthy grass uh, Stu talked about it, Larry talked about it earlier, that good healthy grass actually protects the environment. Uh, certainly we can do bad things, you know, if people take the wrong chemical and put it down the wrong way, 
or take the wrong fertilizer and put it down the wrong way, you can cause harm to the environment. But a properly managed, good, green, healthy golf course or good, green, healthy lawn is beneficial to the environment. And I work fairly closely with the Golf Courses Society here in Kansas City uh, and Kansas, and there's a lot of Audubon certified sanctuaries in Kansas. And a lot of people don't realize that a golf course can actually be an Audubon certified sanctuary. And so I work with the Audubon Society and these golf courses to make sure that they are doing the right things that they are, that they're saying they're doing, that they're increasing wildlife and they're providing habitats for birds and butterflies and all kinds of things like that. So uh, something else you can take a look at on the web if you want to look, read more about it. You can Google Audubon certified sanctuaries for golf courses and get more information that way. I put together an extension publication. If you want to look, Google healthy lawn, healthy environment, or if you want to Google that number, MF2940, uh, that's an extensive publication that I put together that gathers all the latest turf grass research and talks about the benefits of turf grass. Uh, so there's lots of things that how benefit, how turf can benefit the environment. And some of them are going to be that Larry talked about how it filters the air and the water. I mean, nothing, like he said, nothing is as good at stabilizing the soil as grass is. When uh, farmers have it, they, when they get to the edge of the field or they have a waterway that runs through that field, they plant grass there because it holds the soil in, your, in, the, in the place. And your, your yard, that soil is being stabilized by that good, healthy grass. Um, there's a lot of, not a lot of, but there's a fair amount of legislation being enacted all around the country that is limiting phosphorus fertilizers for lawns. And I just want to give you a little, my stand on my soapbox for that this afternoon. Uh, basically, the idea is that it started like, we'll say, Minnesota, for example. They have 10,000 lakes there. They were having a lot of algae blooms in their lake. And they're like, where is this algae coming from? Well, it comes from fertilizers, they say. Well, where's the fertilizer come from? Oh, it's coming from those lawn care people and those golf courses. Okay, well, let's not let them put phosphorus fertilizer down on their lawns or their golf courses. Done. They passed the laws. That was about 10 years ago. So far, they haven't changed any amount of algae in those lakes up there. They haven't changed any amount of the phosphorus that's getting into those lakes and streams. The phosphorus that's getting into those lakes and streams in Minnesota and all over the country is coming from soil. It's not coming from grass or fertilizer. Uh, so row cropping, construction of buildings and roads, anytime you disturb the soil, soil is going to wash into the water, just like Larry talked about this morning, and that soil contains minerals in it and nutrients. And then that's what causes the algae blooms. And so I'm just, that's my little, uh, you know, statement to you guys, my environmental soapbox, say, don't buy into this phosphorus legislation. It's not based on science. It's just based on what people think. Oh, I think it's, I think it's those lawn care guys. Let's just not let them do it. It's not true, all right? Good, thick, healthy grass actually fertilizes, or fertilizers, filters the water. Even Larry mentioned it again this morning. You know, if you take water and pour it down through the soil of a, of a, of a lawn, Six feet down, that water is almost drinkable when it comes out of that grassland soil. Grassland, because of the fibrous root system and because of the fat system that grass has, it filters the water very well. It removes contaminants, remove uh, pollutants, and anything else that passes across that water. It's an excellent filter. So grass, grass is good in that regards. Um, so that's my little uh, environmental soapbox. I'll come back down off that for a little bit now, and we'll talk about some of the nuts and bolts that deal with grass management. So three things uh, to do for grass, and I haven't showed you the third one here, but the first one is start with good soil. And we've heard several speakers today talking about how to have good soil. And we're going to talk about some of the myths involved with having good soil here in a little bit. Pick out the best varieties and the best species. Stu was talking about that in his presentation uh, with, in regards to uh, drought tolerance and drought avoidance, finding varieties that grow well in your area. So you can check out ksuturf.com. You can ask your local extension agent. Uh, if you're here on Johnson County Community College campus, you can ask Lika. Uh, get that information. Get some plant lists to help you figure out which plants you should be planting. And then the last one is work. And we're going to go through some of that work uh, part of it here when we get into these myths. Soil test, get it done. It's easy. You can take a soil test. If you live in Johnson County here, you can take a soil test down to the Johnson County Extension Office at 119th and Ridgeview. It's like five, seven bucks, maybe 10, I don't remember. Some years it's free, they have, a, usually they have, sometimes, it's free this year. 
All right, for the first thousand people, it's free to get your soil test done if you're a homeowner in Johnson County. So bring some soil in there and you can get a soil analysis done. And I'll talk about how to do it here on the next slide. But basically you want to take a few, sam few samples from different areas of the yard. Some from the front yard, put that in a baggie. Some from the backyard, put that in a baggie, bring it in and get those two samples analyzed. Um, what else can I say? So yeah, front yard, backyard, or wherever things are different and you want to find some information out. You could also sample the area that's your lawn in one bag and the area that's your garden in a different bag because you're going to receive different results for those and you're going to want to handle those yards differently. Uh, this is the same type of thing I've got on the previous slide. But basically, for turf, we want to take about top six inches of the soil, remove that thatchy part that's on top, throw it in the bag, uh, take you know, a couple two or three inch, uh, two inch diameter cores, a couple of them, you don't need very much, cup or two of soil is all you need in a bag to get it analyzed for nutrients. And for turf, uh, about every three to five years is really all you need to do. Uh, probably on the five year side, if your lawn is fairly old, if you're a relatively new yard, uh, you know, you just got your house built, you just moved out into the edge of town, closer to that every three years might be more acceptable. Uh, but you don't have to get it analyzed every year. Vegetable gardens and things like that, uh, closer to the every year time frame because you're doing different types of things. So along with that, starting with the good soil, we talked about, you know, uh, Stu was talking about having the size of the root volume for our plants. There's lots of products out there that say, well, hey, just apply gypsum to your clay soil. That'll loosen the clay soil. That'll make it drain, right? Or you have this magical miracle jug of stuff that you can spray on the soil, or uh, there's a fungus stuff, I won't name the name, but you pour it on the soil and it just makes the water drain right through the soil. Anybody heard of this stuff? Yeah? Anybody use it? Anybody have good luck with it? Don't know. Don't know, yeah, it's hard to quantify. Six feet, four feet. <laughs> right. So basically, I'll tell you no, uh, those things don't work. I mean, there may be some things, some chemicals, some, usually there's some nitrogen in some of these jugs, so that when you put it on, Oh yeah, the plant responds, it does grow, things must be doing better, but they're not improving the soil. The idea with applying gypsum to a clay soil, that is uh, based on if the soil was salt affected. So if we had a soil that we were using salty water to irrigate, saline water from the ocean, or we were pumping out of a saline well, and we were applying sodium to the soil, then we'd want to apply that calcium from the gypsum to remove the sodium, and that would help that clay soil drain better. But for average Kansas clay soils, gypsum isn't going to help at all. The only thing that's really going to help is going to be organic matter and a fair amount of it. Typically, when I talk about people renovating a clay soil, a clay yard, I'll recommend that they get three inches of compost, pile it on top, and then till it into a six inch depth. And that way you have a nice six inches of homogenized compost and clay soil to grow grass in. Uh, don't just pile three inches of compost on and then try to grow grass in that three inches of compost because then you're just going to have three inches of roots. The grass isn't going to go down to that clay, clay soil. So mix in three inches of compost, till it in six inch deep. Usually don't add sand. Uh, you'll, you'll, if you're involved with athletic fields or golf courses, you'll see they're top dressing their athletic field or their golf course with sand. I don't recommend that for home lawns. You mix sand and clay together and that's how you get concrete. Uh, and so if you're not doing it in the right proportions or the right kinds, you're going to cause more trouble than what you started with. So just stick with organic matter. Uh, Myth-busting varieties. Here's some common myths. All grasses are the same, right? It doesn't matter whether I plant Kentucky bluegrass, it doesn't matter whether, whether I plant tall fescue, or whether it's Cochise tall fescue, or unique Kentucky bluegrass. It doesn't matter what variety it is either. And I can buy my seed or my sod anywhere. Walmart sells the same seed as the grass pad, right? No? <laughs> I would agree, and we're going to talk about that here in the next slide. And then last one I always like is there's this, this always there's this grass in the Sunday paper usually attached to the comic section that's this magical miracle, either Kentucky bluegrass or some sort of bluegrass or zoysia grass that grows in sun, shade, hot or cold, wet or dry. It must be amazing. Uh, so all grasses are the same. Let's talk about that. No, they're not. When we look at Different, there's definitely differences between tall fescue and Kentucky bluegrass, for example. Tall fescue, it tolerates a little bit more traffic than Kentucky bluegrass does. Uh, tall fescue has a little bit deeper root system, so it can actually avoid the drought that Stu was talking about 
Uh, it can avoid the drought better than Kentucky bluegrass because Kentucky bluegrass has just a little bit shorter root system. Kentucky bluegrass, on the other hand, has underground spreading structures called rhizomes. So if we get some damage in a bluegrass yard, it can fill back in. If we get damage in a fescue yard, we have to apply seed to that fescue yard to get it to fill back in. Uh, those rhizomes that are underneath the ground actually help the Kentucky bluegrass survive. Stu talked about when grass goes into dormancy. Uh, those rhizomes help that Kentucky bluegrass help it survive in dormancy longer than tall fescue. So I usually like mixing the two of them together. We get some of that draft traffic tolerance and the upfront drought avoidance of the tall fescue, but then we get that recuperative ability and the long lasting uh, recoverability. You know, so once we get into a drought situation and we're not irrigating our bluegrass lawn, that bluegrass will survive that drought longer. And so those rhizomes help that out. So I like mixing the two of them together. Um, and if you want some more information, you know, we've got lots of research reports. Otherwise, just follow the blog and I'm gonna show you the URL for the Kansas Turfgrass blog where we post some information on which varieties are growing well and so forth. Kentucky bluegrass, when we do a variety trial for Kentucky bluegrass, there's big differences among the Kentucky bluegrass varieties. And we look at them, you know, it's pretty neat. Most people, you know, you, you maybe you, if you're living in rural Kansas or you drive through rural Kansas, you might see cornfields or wheat fields where they have variety trials. You see one corn's real tall, one short, another one tall. And you're like, wow, how can that be? Wow, it's pretty neat to see these differences in varieties. And the same thing happens with grass. We'll plant grass in five foot or six foot square plots and one plot will be green all year round, and another one will just get clobbered and die and not survive. And that's pretty cool. Even though they're all Kentucky bluegrasses, there's differences in them. Tall fescues, we have a trial down in Wichita that just ended this last year. There was 116 varieties of tall fescue in the trial. A lot of grass to look at, and probably 50 of them, the top 50 of them, were all the same. Uh, so there's not as much variability among the tall fescues as there is among the Kentucky bluegrasses, but there is differences. And so I would tell you to take a look at KSU and, and we have a recommended list on the blog of which ones are better to plant and which ones are worse. I can buy my seed or sod anywhere. Nope, right? I think you guys kind of figured that one out. But basically, if we look at Walmart, and not to point, point fingers or pick fun at Walmart or whatever, but they're buying seed for the whole country. Right? They're going to buy seed for the whole country, so they're going to get a good price, and they're going to get a lot of it. They don't care whether it was the best variety that grows in Kansas or the best variety that grows in Maine. They just want to get a lot of it and get a good price. The grass pad, uh, suburban, those people are going to be looking to buy grass that grows well in Kansas because they want their customers to come back and buy more grass seed from them. So I would tell you to seek out, go to nursery stores, go to your local nursery stores, and get seed that is designed to grow best in Kansas. Uh, you know, this one's a no-brainer. The grass I see in the Sunday paper must be amazing. If it was so amazing, I wouldn't be here. <laughs> I wouldn't have a job. I could just say, yep, that's it. See you later. <laughs> so, no, nothing on that, the Sunday paper grass is that amazing. So, some mowing mitts. Always bag your clippings, right? They cause thatch. People always say, oh, thatch, that's a four-letter word, right? Talk about that a second. Uh, mow it really late. Uh, really short in the fall and early spring. Mulching tree leaves into the lawn is going to, you know, choke out the lawn. It's going to be damaging to the lawn. And mowing it short will make my yard like a golf course. <laughs> you bet. For a week, maybe. Uh, um, so, clippings don't cause thatch. Don't bag your clippings. And it's a lot of work. And I don't understand. We were talking at lunch about how I've helped beautify my neighborhood helped increase the quality of the lawns in my neighborhood just because I'm there. And I'm like, hey, you should do this or you should do that. And we planted more flowers in my neighborhood, that type of thing. But one thing I still can't get all my neighbors to do is stop bagging their clippings. I don't understand why they got to go to Home Depot, buy those paper bags, and work so hard to fill those paper bags full of grass every time they mow. The problem with bagging your clippings is, is that those clippings contain nutrients and a little bit of moisture. Not a lot, but some. And if you put it back into the ground, you're recycling things. Uh, just by recycling your clippings, you're not going to avoid fertilizing your grass. You're still going to have to fertilize your grass whether you bag it or not. But if you always bag your lawn, you're going to have to fertilize more than if you return those grass clippings to the yard. About a quarter of a pound more of nitrogen per thousand square feet per year if you bag those clippings. So put them back on the ground. 
And thatch is not a four-letter word. I think I took it out of this presentation for the time today, but thatch is not bad. Thatch is like mulch in a flower bed. And why do we mulch? Moisture, or keep them warm, keep the soils warm or cool. Moisture, suppress weeds, all those things. And in a, in a turf situation, it also acts as a cushion to help protect the growing point of the plant. Uh, so we want to have some thatch, generally less than three quarters of an inch. And it's hard to describe what thatch is in this time in this class, but take a look, Google it online. You'll find that it's a layer of dead, decomposing stem tissue and root tissue at the soil surface. You'll see some soil, then you'll see this organic matter at the, at the top of the grass uh, surface there. And that's the thatch layer. And we do want to have some thatch. Um, with that being said, clippings don't cause thatch. They break down relatively easily, except zoysia glass. Zoysia grass clippings. Zoysia grass clippings are very stiff and they will cause thatch. And so if you have a zoysia grass lawn, you're going to have a thatch problem. No matter what you do, you're going to have a thatch problem because I don't want you to bag your clippings. Even if they are a zoysia grass lawn, I want you to put them back on the ground. But the zoysia grass is going to have a thatch problem, so you need to take care of that thatch. Get it removed. You know, they used to burn it. Still not, it's not recommended anymore, obviously. Uh, but, you know, get it removed. Power rake it out. Help core areas yawn and get rid of it. So mowing really short in the, in the spring, late fall, and early spring. So the idea would be, well, that last mowing of the year, I can go out, cut it down real short, then it'll stay nice and short all winter long, and it won't grow tall, you know, because even though it's cold outside, the grass is still green, and it's still slowly growing, and so the idea might be, well, that way I don't have to go out and get out and mow it so early in the springtime. Don't mow it short in the fall. At the end of the season, once you get done mowing, just get done mowing. Don't drop it down real short. Just stay at the same height all fall long. If you mow it real short, you could cause some problems. It could get some freeze damage, and it can cause you to have to get some winter desiccation as well. It'll dry out. In the springtime, it's more of an aesthetic thing. Uh, you know, if you look out across this yard, it's got a lot of brown color into it, but there's still green color into it. And if it starts to warm up, that green color will be close to the soil surface. So if we go out and mow that grass short, we'll see the green color faster because we'll, we'll remove all the brown color, right? So the grass looks like it greened up overnight. Uh, that works okay, unless we were to get a couple hard freezes after we mow that grass real short, then that short grass will have some brown tips to it. It won't kill the grass, but it'll, you'll have lost that green advantage over your neighbors that you were hoping to get for. And that's really the only reason to do it is to have an advantage over your neighbors or just to make yourself feel more like spring. It looks better. Um, so mulching tree leaves into the lawn is damaging to the lawn. No, mulch them right up. Turn your lawnmower, you know, get it out there, chop up all those tree leaves. There's a lot of research out of Purdue and um, what was the other one? I don't, Tennessee, I believe, where they mulched their tree leaves right into the ground and it didn't cause any problem. It actually was helpful. Oak, leaves, oak, any leaves you want. They did oak leaves, maple leaves, pine needles, as long as you mulched them up so that they're mulched and not big chunk and matting the grass down, uh, mulching them up is going to be fine. I, I, I did kill my lawn, so I'm getting a little too carried away. Uh-huh. So, yeah. yeah, so I mean, normally when we're talking top dressing, anything, whether it be leaves or compost, we're looking about a half an inch of material. So if, if your mulched up leaves pile up deeper than a half an inch, then you're going to cause some problems. Um, mowing it short will make my yard look like a golf course. No, uh, the golf course grass on putting greens is special grass. It's designed, it's evolved over millions of years to be really, really short. And if you mow Kentucky bluegrass or tall fescue, it'll survive for a week or two at that short height, and then it won't. Uh, it will die. It's evolved to be higher. So if you go to KSU turf, you can find some mowing heights, but generally tall fescue, we're looking at about three inches for most of the spring and the fall. Uh, raise it up in the summertime to closer to four inches. Uh, Kentucky bluegrass, two, two and a half inches in the spring and the fall. Raise it up to three, three and a half in the summer. And the reason why we want to raise it up in the summer is it just gives that grass a little bit more uh, leaf area to absorb sunlight and photosynthesize. And it also gives it more of a leaf area to shade the soil surface. Because uh, if the soil gets hot, the roots get hot. And if the roots don't grow, like Stu was talking about this morning, Roots don't grow, the plant don't grow. Uh, so we gotta have good roots for our grass. So raise it up in the summertime and bring it back down in the spring, in the fall. 
Uh, the one-third rule is the general mowing rule. And maybe I got the, nope, I took the, I took some, I can't remember. I've been trying to take so many slides out of this presentation because I only got 45 minutes to roll with. But the, the one-third rule is our rule of thumb for mowing grass, which means never remove more than one-third of the leaf tissue at any one time. So if we're mowing Kentucky bluegrass at two inches high, we don't want to let it grow higher than three before we mow it. If we're mowing our three-inch tail fescue, we don't want to let the, get the fescue get higher than four, four and a quarter before we mow it. And the idea of what that does is that keeps these clippings nice and small so they'll easily disperse over the yard so you don't have to bag them so they're not leaving those big balls of grass smothering your lawn out there. And then it helps the grass, uh, you know, I know you don't, you're not going to believe me, but grass has feelings and it kind of understands how it's supposed to grow. And if you can imagine, the leaf is a factory, right? It's absorbing sunlight and producing food for the rest of the plant. And if we let this factory grow really big and tall, and then we cut it completely in half, what's it going to do? It's going to say, wow, I had a big factory yesterday, and today I got a real small factory. I'm going to have to stop doing some of the things I was doing. I'm going to have to stop growing roots. I'm going to have to stop spreading out across the yard. I'm just going to have to hang on and to survive with what this little factory I have left with. Uh, so, but if you let the grass only grow up so big and cut it back, so big and cut it back, it's going to go, oh, okay, I know what I can do. Now I can grow some roots and I can spread out. Okay? It's a little theological way to think about things, but uh, that's the way it works in reality. <laughs> okay? So the one-third rule. The downside with the one-third rule is that means in the springtime and in the fall, you're probably going to have to mow more than every seven days. Right? I don't know about your guys' neighborhood, but mine, you know, Sunday after church, the garage doors roll up, everybody goes out their lawnmower, mows the lawn, and then we're back inside to have a beer and watch football. Uh, but you're going to have to mow on Sundays and maybe Thursdays in the springtime so that the grass doesn't get ahead of you. After teaching master gardeners for a number of years, I found that they get very uptight about this rule. Well, what happens if it rains? What happens if I'm gone? What's going to happen then? That's going to be bad. I'm like, well, okay, it's a guideline, all right? So if you have to skip it every once in a while, if you've got a bag because it rained for two weeks straight and you've got super tall grass, fine, bag it. I'd rather you go out, mow it real high, spread the clippings out, Come back later that afternoon or the next day, drop it down again, mow it high, keep dropping it down over a period of a couple days and get it back to where it was rather than bag and haul the clippings away. But it doesn't have to be every time, as I wanted to say. It's a guideline. How do you feel about the use of PGRs? PGRs, growth regulators, uh, absolutely works very well for uh, controlling. So there, there are growth regulators that you can apply to grass to limit the amount of that they grow. Uh, the problem is for homeowners is that it's very difficult to apply these products uniformly and have success. Uh, even me as a turf grass professional, I thought, oh, this would be a piece of cake. I'll throw a backpack sprayer on. I'll go out and spray some growth regulators across my yard. It was awesome. I had these little low spots and then these tall triangles where I had, you know, and so you got it. It's very hard to spray growth regulators and, and get it uniformly. So I've got a boom sprayer now that I can spray and get a nice uniform application of the growth regulator. So a commercial company, growth regulator is great. Homeowner, uh, not so much. So not, not, not say that homeowners use, can't spray, but. In the retail, it's a good idea. Yeah, they definitely cut back on my mowing in the springtime. I love it. My neighbors are out there mowing like the devil, and I'm not. <laughs> so, and I think there's more companies out there that are applying, you know, growth regulators as part of their program. I don't know exactly what Ryan Lawn Trees program is, but there I know other companies are, so. Yep. All right. So we talked about this already. Here it is in the presentation, just to remind myself to say all those things. Um, also, mowing regularly helps control weeds. You know, if you let the grass grow real tall, it's going to start spending all of its energy and growing upright instead of growing across the yard. And we want the grass to grow across the yard. We want it to be thick and have lots of leaves per square foot. When it's thick, the weeds can't fit in the yard. If it's growing real tall, it's going to be thin and tall, and then the weeds can grow up in, in beside the grass. So grow, mowing regularly can cut down on weeds. The other time I see problems with is when people grow seed. They put a little patch of seed out there. Um, you know, they say, oh, I'm going to take really good care of this. They're watering it by hand every day. And they're like, oh, I know mowing is stressful. I don't want to let that grass get stressed out by mowing. And so they let it grow really tall, thinking, okay, I'm going to make sure that grass is good and healthy before I mow it. Don't. Once your seedlings get to the recommended height, three inches or four inches, get out there and get that grass cut. And uh, that'll help stimulate that grass 
to grow across the lawn instead of up the yard. So some fertilizer myths. Lawns don't need to be fertilized. I hear this a lot with buffalo grass. You know, buffalo grass, the magical miracle, low maintenance or no maintenance grass. Buffalo grass needs to be fertilized. We're gonna talk about it here in the next slide. Uh, fertilize the grass poisons the environment. We talked about that earlier and we're gonna go into more detail. The numbers on the bag uh, or the kind of fertilizer I buy, it doesn't really matter. We'll talk about that here in a second. So lawns don't need to be fertilized. Almost every lawn needs to be fertilized. Some lawns need to be fertilized more than others, but every grass lawn will benefit from having some fertilizer applied to it. If we don't fertilize the lawn, it'll become thin and weak. And I've got a nice, this is in my neighborhood, this nice high maintenance bluegrass and fescue yard over here. This lawn has never been fertilized, probably never fertilized since this house was built 12 years ago. And if you look real close, there's bare soil sticking through the ground here. Uh, and it's just a matter of time before that soil starts eroding and creating valleys in his yard. And soil starts washing over the sidewalk and creating all kinds of problems in this yard. Now, fertilizer alone may not fix this yard, but definitely if you would fertilize the yard, it would go a long way to get it to start back into the right track. Uh, so fertilize the yard. I can't stress that enough. I see so many yards that just people go, I'm not doing anything to my yard. And lawns do need to be fertilized. And we'll talk about when here in a little bit, uh, I think. Um, so fertilizing the grass poisoning the environments, you know, only if you're putting the fertilizer on the street. If the, once the fertilizer is in the grass, the thick fibrous uh, leaves and the thick fibrous root system traps that fertilizer in the yard. It doesn't go anywhere. Uh, unless we have a very steep slope and a big two inch rain, the fertilizer isn't going to leave that yard. It stays trapped in the yard. Um, here's another picture of under fertilization. So we want to make sure we have thick, healthy grass and that fertilizer is going to help thicken up the grass. This is where I wanted to get to here was keep it out of the street though. Keep it off the sidewalks, keep it off the driveway. If the fertilizer lands on the driveway, lands on the sidewalk, when it rains, it's going down the storm sewer and then it's gonna go in the stream, and then it's gonna go in the lake. It's not a lot of fertilizer, it's not a lot of pollution, but it is pollution. And I, like Larry was talking about, I am an environmentalist. I do enjoy the environment. I wanna protect it as much as I can for myself and for my children. And so don't get fertilizer on the sidewalk. Don't get fertilizer on the street. If you do get it on the street, just brush it right back into the grass. Get a leaf blower, blow it right back into the grass. Same thing goes for your grass clippings and your tree leaves. Grass clippings, remember when we talked about thatch, I said those grass clippings contain nutrients in them. So if those nutrients are out in the street, the nutrients go down the storm sewer and they end up in the, the streams and waterways. Same way with tree leaves. When I grew up, that was the thing, right? You blew all the tree leaves out to the street. At least they went in your yard, they were in the street. Not my problem anymore. And then it was fun when I've got you know, 16, I suppose, and drive your car through those big piles of leaves and poof. Uh, but those leaves go down the drain and those leaves have nutrients in them. Okay, so don't put them in the street. Get them out of the street. Some of the research that came out of the University of Minnesota, we were talking about the phosphorus legislation up there. They found that running a street sweeper through the streets on a weekly basis greatly cut back the amount of nutrients that were entering the streams and the waterways just because of the tree leaf litter, the grass clippings, and any other soaps and oils and fertilizers that might have been in the street. That did more for cleaning up the city water than cutting back on phosphorus in lawn fertilizers did. So good things out of that anyway. So do your part to protect the environment. I skipped over this slide, uh, like we talked about a little bit also this morning, you know, some is good, too much is bad. If we over fertilize our grass, it can become very soft. It can be more susceptible to traffic stress, heat stress, and disease. So fertilize properly uh, to make sure the grass is growing well. And I don't have enough time to go through all the fertilizer, all the proper fertilizer techniques for cool season grasses or warm season grass. But essentially you want to put down most of your fertilizer in the fall, probably two pounds total, a pound in September and a pound of nitrogen in November. Uh, and then maybe another pound in the springtime in May and maybe another pound somewhere in early spring or late spring. Depends on how much you want to go. But three pounds is a good starting point. Most lawn care companies are closer to the four or four and a half pound rate to really have that super nice dark green lawn. Uh, but I generally fertilize my yard with about three pounds of fertilizer, three pounds of nitrogen per thousand square feet per year. 
Um, let's move on. So irrigation. The more I water, the better my grass will perform. And we kind of talked about that with Stu's presentation, Water Wars, this morning. Water in the afternoon to cool the lawn, water a little bit every day. And if I don't irrigate, my grass will die. So busted, 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 busted. Um, roots need air to breathe. And one of my favorite analogies Stu talked about this morning with trees is, you know, <clears throat> a lot of people think about tree roots. And when I grew up and, and was taking science classes in, in elementary or whatever, I remember seeing the cartoon drawing of the tree. They had the branches of the tree going straight up in the air, and they said whatever was above the ground was below the ground. So the root, the trees went, you know, 20 feet, tree branches went 20 feet in the air, the roots go 20 feet in the air. There may be tree roots that go 20 feet in the air, but all the action happens in that 12 inches. That's where 90% of all the roots that absorb nutrients, that absorb air, that absorb water, happens in that top 12 inches of the soil. And the same thing goes for grass. All the action happens in probably the top six inches of the soil for grass. Uh, we do have grasses that have roots that go deeper, but it's really the air. I mean, water goes down, right? You've dug a hole, it gets, stays wet all the way down to the bottom of that two foot hole or three foot hole. The soil is wet down there, but there's no air down there. And so roots need air to breathe. I use the analogy of a sponge. I don't know where I'm at on time. Better not, better not use the analogy of the sponge, but anyway, you can. <laughs> Try to breathe through a wet sponge. It's really hard, okay? Soil roots can't do the same thing. So make sure we have some air in the soil. And so what we want to do is allow some time between irrigation vents. And I'll go through that on the next slide. The key phrase is deeply and infrequently. Um, if you water in the afternoon, the grass is going to stay wet from, say you water at 3 o'clock, it's going to be wet from 3 o'clock in the afternoon until probably 8 or 9 o'clock tomorrow morning when the sun comes up. And that's going to be a good 12, 20 hours of moisture on that grass, and that's going to help fungus grow. All of the turf grass diseases, most of the turf grass diseases we have are fungal diseases, and they all like moisture. They all need moisture. So if we keep the grass wet, we're just helping the disease grow. So we want to water early in the morning, 5, 6 o'clock, 7 o'clock, 8 o'clock even, so that that grass is only wet for a few hours, and it will reduce our severity of disease. We talked about the roots needing air to breathe, so don't water every day. We need to water every other day, or every five days, or every seven days. We're going to explain that here in a second. If I don't irrigate my grass, it will die. Uh, it will go dormant. That was what Stu was talking about, the drought avoidance of grass. When it gets too hot, too dry, the grass says, okay, I give up. I'm going to take a nap, and when it gets cooler, when the rains return, I'll start growing again. And that's normal for grass. You know, this grass out here right now is brown because it's under winter dormancy. It's too cold. It's too dry. It's not going to grow. It's going to sleep until the springtime, and then it'll grow and recover. The same thing happens in the summertime. How long can it survive without water in the summertime? It depends. There's my best answer. But generally, about five weeks, five to eight weeks without water. Uh, you know, we've done some research. Stu was talking about 60 days without water on the Kentucky bluegrass, and it all came back and looked great. Uh, so, but general rule of thumb is about five weeks is what we're looking at. Five to eight weeks for tall fescue in Kentucky bluegrass yards uh, in Kansas. The other thing is, if it does die, it's really easy to reseed Kentucky bluegrass and tall fescue. Unless you had a fall like we had last fall, which was pretty rough. <laughs> I don't know about you guys, but a lot of people lost a lot of grass, and getting grass seed to grow last fall was pretty hard. But in normal years, it's really easy. Um, so the term I mentioned earlier is deeply and infrequently. We want to water a whole lot of water today and wait as many days as possible before we irrigate again. That gets the water deep into the root zone, and then it allows the soil to dry up. That allows air to move down from the top. That prevents weed seeds from germinating, and that prevents diseases from growing. The big question that everybody asks is, well, how deep and how infrequent? Well, it's a sliding scale. First. We usually try to always irrigate about an inch of water at a time. And so that's how deep. How deep is that? Or how, many, how much is an inch of water? Everybody goes, well, just tell me. Is that five minutes? Is that 10 minutes? Is that 15? I, I want to know. Well, I don't know. Everybody's system is different. But if you want to know, stick a rain gauge out there. Turn your sprinkler on. I don't have a sprinkler system. I have a I drag a hose, you know. Just turn your sprinkler on. Time it for 15 minutes or time it for half an hour then find out how much water is in the rain gauge and then you'll know you can do some math to figure out whether how long it takes to get an inch of water okay 
How frequent? It's a sliding scale. It depends on the weather, basically. In the springtime, it's cool, it's humid, so it might be an inch of water every week or every couple weeks. And that can come from rainfall or irrigation. So if it's raining an inch of water every week in April, we don't have to irrigate. In July, it's closer to an inch of water every three to four days. Um, and and this, is, this is for lawns that we want to keep green and keep alive. If we want to let it turn brown and go dormant, save our water and wait till the fall for it to green back up, which is perfectly okay, then don't irrigate. But for these, this is, these are estimates for people who want to keep their grass looking green all summer long. And there's benefits to having green grass, uh, and you can read about that in the publication, keeping the environment cool and things like that compared to having dormant grass, but that's another discussion. So it's a sliding scale. If you want to watch, I've got some great videos up at the, our water website at water.ksuturf.org. Uh, or there's some good videos on that same, the same videos are on that Healthy Yards website uh, and they're also on our YouTube channel. So there's lots of, there's three or four good videos on how to figure out how much water you're putting out by using some catch cans and, and rain gauges and a good video on how to figure out how frequently to water and a good video on looking at, you know, soil conditions and grass conditions, cues to help you figure out when you should water. There's some good videos online to help you figure that out. We already talked about water early in the morning, so we're going to move on and get closer to the end. Um, this was great. Uh, my neighbor said this to me the other, just last year, the year before, you know, Phil and Jeff. And Phil said, dang that Jeff, look at all the crabgrass he's got in his yard. He's giving me all of his crabgrass. Now look, here's some crabgrass in my yard. Gosh, I hate him. And I'm like, wait a minute. This isn't, this isn't Jeff's problem. Phil, your yard is starting to thin out. Your yard is starting to die and now you're getting crabgrass in those spots, okay? So let me go, I'll come back to the other myth here, but weeds are the result of an unhealthy yard. They're not the cause of it. There's a few weeds like Bermuda grass that can actually move into a yard and choke out the grass, but most of the weeds we deal with in turf fill in the spot where the grass was. So the grass died, the weeds took its place. Stu had a great picture this morning. I don't know why I keep talking about everybody's presentation. In case you weren't here, you should have been here. Uh, but he had a great picture this morning of dormant grass and crabgrass was growing along the curb. The crabgrass came there because the grass was, was dying out. It was getting hot and drying out and disappearing, so the crabgrass filled in a spot. This yard, all these weeds appeared in this yard because the yard died, not because the weeds came in and killed out the yard. Okay? I got another great photo here. This is some zoysia grass out at the research center uh, out at our place in Olathe here. And so we sodded zoysia grass and I seeded Bermuda grass and seeded buffalo grass down here. And all this is crabgrass seed. And there's a couple pieces of crabgrass seed if you look real close on that uh, picture. But there's no crabgrass seed in here, not because I applied any herbicide. No herbicide was applied to this area whatsoever, but just because the zoysia grass was so thick and so dense, it kept the crabgrass out. We didn't get a very good stand of buffalo grass and Bermuda grass, so we still had, we had a lot of crabgrass in there. Uh, but thick turf is your best defense against a lot of weeds. It won't stop all the weeds, but it's the first step and usually the easiest step. Just fertilize it. Get some good seed down. Get the density up and you can stop a lot of weeds. I've got some other organic and corn gluten meal research out there that's showing that type of research, that type of data as well. Come out and see this along with that corn gluten meal research to our field day, which is the last Saturday of July. Uh, always the last Saturday of July and it's sponsored by the Johns County Master Gardeners. And Lee can get you some more information about that too, or just search for a horticulture uh, open house, uh, Johnson County Master Gardeners, last Saturday, July. Anyway, enough commercials. Um, the other myth was here is I should always use weed and feed to treat my whole yard for weeds. So right, a weed and feed. It's a bag of fertilizer, and it's got herbicide sprayed all over the particles of fertilizer. You spread the fertilizer out, that gets the herbicide over the whole yard, that controls your weeds, right? Well, unless your yard is really bad, even this yard is not really bad, there's only weeds kind of right in this general area. We don't need to put weed and feed over here, maybe there's a few weeds over here. So this yard is in pretty poor shape, but we don't need to put weed and feed all over the whole yard. We don't need to put herbicide over the whole yard. Just buy plain fertilizer and get some ready to use spot spray stuff and go out and spot spray the weeds wherever they are. Maybe the first year you start this program, now that you're getting in the turf, you might have weeds everywhere, and so you buy a weed and feed just to get your whole yard back into shape. But next year, just go out and spot spray them. I find it therapeutic. 
You know, I mean, uh, <laughs> I'm going to go back and check that guy out next week. I'm going to watch you die. Uh, I'm kind of bad that way, I suppose. But anyway, there's, there's fun in doing that, I think. And, and so you're not spreading chemical all over the whole yard, right? You're not spreading it everywhere. You're just putting it where you need it. It's a little bit safer for the environment. Last few slides here, mole myths. You know, everybody says, oh, I got moles. Uh, so I must have grubs, right? Because moles eat grubs. So if I put down a grub chemi chemical, that'll get rid of the grubs, and that'll get rid of my moles. Nope. Moles eat worms. They don't eat grubs. They will eat grubs, but they're really there eating the worms. And you can't kill the worms, nor do you want to kill the worms. So the only best defense against moles is to trap them. There are poisons uh, that you can buy, a bait, if you will, called talprid. It's shaped like a little gummy worm uh, because moles eat worms. Uh, so uh, I have kids. I don't think my kids put a lot of stuff in their mouth that they find on the ground, but you never know. Uh, so this is a poison and it's shaped like a worm. You might want to be careful thinking about it. The same way with using chewing gum, castor oil, tobacco. There's all kinds of magical, miracle things you can stuff in the hole to get rid of moles, and none of them work. The best defense is uh, trapping them. Uh, or you could, Talper does work, but I'm a little leery about using it in my own yard. And I can talk to you guys about how to trap moles after the break or after I get done here, done with this presentation. Seeding, I don't know what it is, but you know, pretty soon the tulips are going to start blooming and you're going to hear commercials on the radio for different brands of seed. And everybody's going to say, hey, seed, seed, seed. So everybody's kind of, some, a lot of people have it in their mind that spring is the best time to seed your lawn. Fall is the best time to seed your lawn. With that being said, if you have bare spots in your yard, seed now, seed in the spring. I don't want you to wait till the fall and leave this big bare soil spot in your yard because Rod said the fall is the best time. Uh, but if you're going to kill your yard, if you're going to start all over from scratch, do it in the fall. We, I was talking about last fall being really bad. Uh, so there was a lot of seed that didn't germinate last fall. There was a lot of people that had some seed die because it was so dry last fall. So people are going out and seeding now, what's called dormant seeding, and they're going to do some early spring seeding to try and get those lawns thickened back up before the summertime. But fall is usually the best time to grow grass. And the idea is there is that we have all of the fall, all of the winter, and all of the spring for that grass to grow and get thick and healthy and mature before the heat of the summertime comes. If I let my grass grow tall, whoops, it will actually go to seed and seed itself. And I hear this a lot with buffalo grass, you know, I'm collecting the seed, I'm going to try to get it. No, usually the seed that most of these grasses produce is fairly sterile and it doesn't grow very well. Just buy seed and put it down on the ground. Don't try to let it grow tall. Again, it goes back to if we're letting it grow tall, it's not going to be thick across the yard. It's going to be one single plant spaced far apart. We already talked about all grass seed being different uh, or some grass seed being different. This is another favorite one. Hey, my neighbor's got brown patch. Now they're going to give it to me. Oh, why, why won't they take care of their brown patch? Sorry, you have brown patch in your yard. The fungus organism that grows brown patch is already there in your soil. It's laying out here in this soil already out here. The reason why there's no brown patch going there or growing in your yard is because the environmental conditions are different in your yard or you have a different type of grass. Uh, so praise yourself on having something better in your yard that you don't have the brown patch yet. Uh, but it's not like they're going to walk across your, their yard and then walk into your, your yard and give it to you. It's already there, okay? So don't worry about that. Um, last thing uh, on disease, again, most diseases like it hot and like it humid, so keep that surface dry. We talked about that with irrigation. Increase airflow, so if you've got lots of bushes and lots of fences, keeping the wind from blowing across, across your yard, maybe open some channels, cut some bushes out, to get some air flow through the yard. Fertilize so you have healthy grass, but don't fertilize in the summertime. Most of the, the biggest disease we have on tall fescue is called brown patch, and it really likes lawns that are fertilized in June and July. So I would try to avoid fertilizing too much in June and July or at all. And if you really got a problem and you really don't want to have any brown patch, there are fungicides that you can apply that will take care of that. That was Lawn Care 101, myth busting in 45 minutes, or a little bit more, yeah. Is it possible to actually grow grass in deep shade? To grow grass in deep shade uh, depends on the type of shade. Usually, I would say no. I mean, you don't see grass growing in the forest. No. Uh, the two things with growing grass under trees is going to be sunlight and moisture. 
And so if we can do anything to get some more direct sunlight, you know, if we can limb up the tree, limbing out the tree is usually a temporary thing because usually the tree will fill itself back in relatively quickly. But if you can limb it up so that we get in a couple hours of direct sunlight, that'd be great. The other thing is that, you know, I said the tree roots are all in the top 12 inches of the soil, so they're stealing moisture. Uh, we talked about this morning, young trees, the grass will steal the moisture from the young trees, but mature trees, the grass steals the, mo or the trees steal the moisture from the grass. So we might need to irrigate a little bit more frequently underneath those trees so the grass has a little bit more moisture to survive. Otherwise, give up. And, and uh, I got a ground cover study started out at the center where we're looking at, yeah, there's ground covers that we're looking at to see that we can replace turf, and so we can take a look at that too. Now, yeah, absolutely. Uh, and the idea with putting it down now, it's not going to germinate now. It won't germinate until the soils get a little bit warmer, about 50 degrees. But if you put it down now, especially maybe not today because the soil is a little bit muddy, uh, but last week was great because the soil was dry. You could get out there, you could rake the soil a little bit, sprinkle the seed in there, and rake it back up. That's perfect. Uh, and, and if you wait closer to the springtime, then it gets muddier and muddier, and it's hard to get out and work the ground. So it's a good time to do it now. What do you think the chances are for some of that late seeding that was done last week with no water to come up? It's hard to say. Uh, if it was late enough that you can guarantee that it didn't germinate, it's going to lay there, and it's just like as if you put the seed down now. It's not going to. It wouldn't have died or frozen or got damaged over the winter time. Sixty some degree days, and some of that tried to germinate. If it if it tried to germinate and froze, then that seed's going to be dead. So I, I've been advising a lot of people is to have some seed on hand and be ready and watching. And if it, was a, if it was a very important area and you can still see where you put the seed down, grab some of that soil and the seed and put it in a cup and put it in your office or put it in, a, in some place warm with some sunlight and see if it germinates. And if it germinates, great. If it doesn't germinate in a couple weeks, then you might want to get some more seed down on the ground ready to go. Anytime, anytime over the winter time when the ground isn't frozen. Uh, so usually we talk about after Thanksgiving so that we know that the ground is not going to be warm enough to have any germination in the fall. Usually after Thanksgiving, the ground stays cold enough that it shouldn't germinate again until February. Uh, but if the ground's frozen and you put the seed on there, then it can wash away. But anytime the ground's not frozen, you can put it down over the winter time. On your trials, do you use standard rates or do you use a heavier rate? Standard, yep, yep. I want them to do what you... Yeah, so normally fescue, I'm seeding bare soil fescue to about eight pounds. Okay. Uh, and some people go more and some people go less, but the eight pounds is kind of right in the middle of things. Okay. So eight pounds per thousand. What do you think about adding, um, if you're doing bare stuff, you're tapping it off a little bit? Yep, that's a, good that's a good way to help hold some of the moisture in there. Don't put so much on it that it actually creates a layer. I mean, you're just looking for maybe half an inch just to lightly cover up the thing. I usually don't recommend... I don't like using straw because usually straw has a lot of weed seeds in it and that can cause some more problems. Uh, and I usually don't like using a, a cover crop like annual rye uh, or wheat because then it actually actually outcompetes the fence through the bluegrass and you end up with a thin lawn, but compost is a good, good choice. What's the shelf life of, uh, of grass seed? You know, so I bought some last year, I didn't use it all. Right. Yeah, it's totally good. This is so the shelf life of grass seed, if you kept it cool and kept it dry, Probably three years, three to four years. Uh, if you put it in the upper part of your shed out in the outside, and you got to 110 last summer, the, it's going to drop off drastically. It may not very much of it may not be left uh, viable, but it's three to four years if it's cool and dry. So, and it's going to go down every year a little bit. But okay. Okay. Any other questions? All right, thank you very much. Thanks,